100,000 range of uh, uh, viral count. The viral count does spike and increase and then decrease in the first years after infection and then starts to increase again. Uh, but anyway, the reason I'm sharing these studies is um, the one study explains how two of seven of uh, the AIDS patients in one of the particular studies had multinucleated cells in their brain. And uh, there's other infections and diseases that can cause multinucleated cells in the rest of the body. And uh, if you, I'm, I'm, I need to see a neurologist and see if they can uh, better uh, not do a biopsy. I don't want them taking brain tissue or something, but if they can better, uh, understand or, you know, diagnose me with that specifically, awesome. Uh, but, uh, I have been taking, taking stuff that has helped a lot with that. And I think that multinucleid, uh, issue was a, uh, a factor in some of my symptoms. And then also these reservoirs of HIV in the brain and other parts of the body uh, can be a barrier uh, to people recovering from the illness. And I'm not an expert and I would like to uh, study more, maybe even go back to school for medical school or for uh, neurology and maybe psychology as well but uh because i feel like having this experience and understanding what it feels like uh and being able to describe that with correct me medical terminology could better explain it to people who haven't experienced it because the reason i'm sharing these studies in this video is because for one uh the one medication mentioned is not going to be likely recommended by your doctor it's usually prescribed by a psychiatrist. Uh, it should also be prescribed by neurologists treating AIDS patients uh, due to the multinucleide issue that I described. And I'm not 100% certain I was experiencing that issue because I wasn't told that by a neurologist. But I can tell you that uh, my symptom sense diagnosis have improved drastically uh, and I'm feeling much better but all I can describe is uh, first off I was having ex experiencing uh, terrible symptoms uh, uh, over a year prior to my diagnosis in 2018 I was uh, I went to the ER for debilitating headaches and the headache had lasted for months at that point and uh, they did not know I had HIV. I did not know I had HIV. By that point, it was already AIDS. And, um, and so they did a CT scan. They saw a, uh, they saw a, uh, they saw inflammation in my sinuses. And when I went back to the hospital and I was admitted for about a week in infectious diseases, due to an extremely high fever after my diagnosis when my CD4 count was back up to 25. I was in real rough shape uh, acclimating to the medications and I showed uh, sinus inflammation on the MRIs then. Uh, but anyway, the point is the first time I went into the hospital, they showed the sinus inflammation and they discharged me with ibuprofen without doing any lab work. If there's any nurses or doctors watching this, you have a patient come in and they have a, a, a inflammation or headaches like that, um, I would recommend that they uh, do some lab work on that patient and give them an HIV test. It might not be what it is, but uh, for me, that would have been a game changer for me. And as far as the rest of these studies go, I just recommend you read them. It may be difficult to understand if you don't know the medical terminology. Uh, honestly, don't understand all the medical terminology fully, but I am uh, making it a goal of mine to read more medical studies, maybe get some medical textbooks, listen to some college lectures online, and download some seminars 
and be able to better understand this information so I can write about it myself and better express myself because the experience that I, I believe may have been caused by the new multinucleide uh, issue, which I just uh, described as inflammation in the past, uh, is a very unique experience. And if I try to describe it without medical terminology, I would just sound like a crazy person. I'm not a crazy person. But uh, for uh, making this video specifically for if you are diagnosed uh, with AIDS and you're watching this and it's a recent diagnosis, uh, first off, there are certain aspects that you're going to, you should get a neurologist appointment if you're experiencing what I can describe as uh, there's a general feeling as mal of malaise and fatigue and unwellness and all sorts of stuff but you might also be experiencing insomnia and all I can describe as severe severe mental cognitive distress that is a physical sensation in addition to it has a psychological element but it's not a psychologically or situationally caused anxiety or something like that and if you've experienced it you know what I'm talking about. It's just a very unpleasant, unwell feeling that might be accompanied by a mild headache. And uh, it is not possible to describe it to someone that hasn't experienced it. And a lot of the doctors out there, they're great doctors, um, but they might not have experienced it themselves. And they're also not neurologists. And for the one medication I mentioned earlier in the video, that's usually prescribed by psychiatrists and for anxiety, but the fact is it's, it works and is functional uh, for physical, it has physical me mechanisms of action that can help break up some of those uh, multinucleated cells, and I think it could relieve a lot of people's severe symptoms and give them a better quality of life. And then the other articles, there's two articles which speak specifically, uh, discuss specifically the multinucleated cell issue. And there is a few other uh, articles there about reservoirs of HIV in the body. And uh, so I recommend you do your own research, try to learn some of the, the technical terminology. Don't expect uh, your doctor to understand everything which is why I recommend doing your own research and it's also partially uh, they might be recommended to uh, prescribe this or that or maybe view certain medications in a certain way but there may be effective treatments that can help you and uh, that's why I'm making this video and uh, I just want to explain all that and uh, I'm feeling a lot better doing a lot better than I was so if you're in bad shape, I was in real bad shape when I first uh, was diagnosed, real low CD4 count. And the other part is, is in the brain itself, uh, some of those medications don't pass the blood-brain barrier. If you're familiar with that, it's just like, um, think about it right now with the coronavirus, with the, the higher density of the mass, the more fewer particulates that can get in. Uh, it's like that with the brain's membrane. Uh, a lot of medications don't pass that membrane into your brain. And uh, HIV only advances into the brain in very advanced late stages. So this is why I'm speaking specifically, especially if you were diagnosed with a very, very low CD4 count and high viral count and no secondary illness. And some of these articles talk about uh, secondary illnesses. Now, if you are a very low CD4 count and experiencing severe symptoms and fevers and other types of symptoms, I was, uh, when I went to the, um, the hospital and was admitted into the infectious disease unit, they did a variety of tests to make sure it wasn't flu, to make sure it wasn't a neurological neurological disease they did an MRI and they did a spinal tap to check my spinal fluids for other stuff check for to toxoplasmosis they did dozens of uh, 
blood tests and while it was not a pleasant experience it's very important to do uh, to rule out any possible secondary infections but I'm sharing these articles specifically because you should also know that there might be symptoms caused that are not due to secondary infections uh, but rather due to the HIV virus itself and there are uh, uh, there are possible answers and treatments. Uh, the most important is to continue on with antiretroviral. And my uh, uh, my viral count has gone down significantly, but these uh, the multinucleotide uh, cell clusters that are not cancerous and are benign from that standpoint, uh, and some of these other reservoirs of HIV in the body. Uh, might mean that your cell count is down, but the HIV is still uh, present in certain parts of your body and may be causing additional symptoms and damage. And uh, yeah. so uh, good sleep, good nutrition, all that good jazz is very important. Uh, for recovery and I do believe that some of these symptoms that affect the brain can contribute to insomnia and some people even just HIV patients that are uh, not don't have advanced HIV inf infection do have an adverse uh, uh, reaction to the antiretrovirals and that can include insomnia uh, the dapsone our Bactrim our, and I, antibiotic regimens can also include insomnia as side effects. And I can tell you right now for both your cognitive health as well as your general health, your daily fatigue, your general quality of life, uh, feeling of well-being, uh, that sickly malaise feeling, all that sort of thing. Uh, it's very important to be able to get plenty of sleep and uh, I've uh, experienced, I mean, experimented with different supplements. Uh, Benadryl and melatonin are very good basic, uh, you know, uh, uh, way to help, which is effective and has been effective for me for the most part. Although I do think that uh, diazepam or benzodine uh, type of sedatives can be very helpful for patients in those stages if they are experiencing very severe uh, insomnia or other types of symptoms and not only because it helps you sleep but because of this other stuff and you know maybe part of the reason that it reduced some of those multinucleotide things is because the people were able to sleep and stay asleep and get their REM sleep and heal because a lot of the body's healing happens when you are sleeping. And uh, I'm just warning you that doctors are not uh, eager or keen to prescribe any sort of uh, benzopine. So just be aware of that. Uh, but I... Uh, and I don't think that is the correct answer for everyone. But if you do, I, according to this study and uh, what I've experienced is it can be very effective. Uh, and potentially what you might be experiencing is uh, the, uh, the effects of that multinucleotide uh, stuff, which is if you experience that, it is... Uh, unspeakably unpleasant and uh, if you go to a psychologist and describe some of your symptoms even if your symptoms are caused by your physical ailment uh, they might prescribe uh, antipsychotics and antidepressants and all sorts of stuff that might not help improve your symptoms they might interact with your other medications uh, and it might not uh, solve the, the root cause of what is causing your discomfort. Uh, and I don't even know how to describe it. It's like not just mental cognitive. Uh, it's like a sensation, not just psycho uh, psychological. 
And of course, you're going to have uh, physical discomfort throughout your body, especially a very low CD4 count. And if you have difficulty acclimating to the medications at first, I can tell you that I was having hives. I was having horrible, horrible side effects to the medications in the first months. And I continue taking it. I have not missed a day of my antiretrovirals. And I can tell you that uh, over time, I have adjusted well to the Victarvi. I don't have significant side effects whatsoever from it anymore. I can tell you it took a long time to get there. Uh, and if you are experiencing continued hives and you are on the Bactrim, uh, they had to switch me to the Azea Myerson and Dapsone because the, uh, the Bactrim was causing, uh, the Bactrim was causing, uh, liver toxicity. And it was severe. I would have had probably liver failure if I continued it. But I do want to explain another thing that is important to understand is that you will have heightened uh, medication reactions when you have a low CD4 count and you'll have heightened allergic reactions. Uh, I had an allergic reaction to amoxicillin or it was penicillin, one of those two earlier in the year prior to my diagnosis to HIV. And I hadn't had that experience before. I was having hives. Uh, it was not as severe as the hives that I had after my diagnosis. I had all sorts of allergic reactions, hives, uh, skin. I forgot how they described it on the, uh, the prescription for the hydroxine, which, by the way, is good for sleep uh, and could be a good alternative uh, for sleep. Uh, to diazepams because uh, diazepams are addictive you need to use moderation and tolerance or or you'll build up tolerance and have withdrawals it's not a uh, it's a serious serious medication but i'm i know that the uh insomnia and uh especially in the early stages when you're very frail is a much more serious issue uh if you're unable to sleep and if it is partially caused by this multinucleated nucleated cells, I am uh, very confident that, uh, I don't know. And also, if you're feeling that unwell, you're not looking to, uh, you're probably not looking to uh, abuse drugs to the point of the where you get tolerance and withdrawals and that sort of thing. You're just probably desperate to... Um, heal and get better and feel normal again which i understand completely uh, but i'm just saying that uh your health care providers might not understand completely and it's impossible to describe uh some of the symptoms and the feelings uh that accompany it the sensations rather uh if you uh it's uh but if also if you're having severe headaches after your diagnosis and you have not been checked for secondary infections, it's very important that you do uh, go to a neurologist or the ER if it's severe and uh, get checked uh, for secondary infections. In my case, I don't have any secondary infections and I am very fortunate, uh, but it still has been a uh, unpleasant experience. And it's getting on much, much more pleasant. I'm starting to feel normal again, like my old self, and uh, getting a good sleep. And uh, yeah, so I'm happy. Like I said earlier, it's my birthday today, and uh, I'm here at my home with my parents. I got my own house out in Colorado. Uh, not out there right now. My girlfriend's out there. We're separated for now uh due to the uh, coronavirus outbreak don't want to get infected my parents are going to the grocery they're going to the grocery store only like once every week and a half or something or we're just ordering stuff to be delivered to the house so we can limit contact with people we got the masks and hand sanitizer and all that sort of thing so take extra precautions for the coronavirus but i wanted to make this video today because i do think that this information might be helpful some people out there and honestly this is a uh, very rare so if you have a low cd4 count a high viral count and you have aids uh, fortunately uh, due to early detection and uh, all sorts of stuff in my case 
uh, I was probably got HIV about a decade ago and there wasn't, I, I had thought in previous blood work and checkups and all sorts of stuff, uh, that I had, I just assumed that I had been tested for it already. And there was very, it was very unlikely that it was HIV, uh, just because there had been a limited opportunity, uh, for me to have it and my partner does not have it and I've been with her for three years and uh, she still doesn't have it fortunately and uh, and my previous partner did not have it and I did not transmit it to her and uh, it was very unlikely that I did have it and so that was one of the reasons for my late diagnosis but I did have it and uh, so don't assume that you have been tested. Uh, go get tested. There's free tests at our clinics, and uh, there's they also sell them at Walmart for like thirty dollars. You can buy your own test. That's how I got tested. I had gone to the doctor repeatedly. Um, the, I was just going to Doc in a Box walk-in clinics uh, throughout 2019 before my diagnosis. I had recurring bronchitis and fevers and all sorts of stuff and thrush, uh, reoccurring thrush. If you're thrush, if you're not diagnosed with HIV or AIDS and you have reoccurring thrush, uh, and it's not treated by the NISAT and it keeps coming back or the NISAT and doesn't do anything. <laughs> like with me, the NISAT and did virtually nothing. Uh, then there, you might have it, but do not be afraid of being tested positive. Be afraid of uh, well, don't be afraid it, no matter what, but just, uh, you, you don't want to, you don't want to test too late. Uh, and, uh, the later you test, the more unpleasant it'll be, believe me. So, uh, don't be worried about, uh, testing positive because especially if you have a high CD4 count and you're still in the hundreds range, you're going to have a much easier, uh, road to recovery, uh, and it'll be much simpler. And uh, as if you've had a lot of potential exposures to it, definitely get tested for it. And even if you haven't had a lot of potential exposures to it, uh, you might not assume AIDS or HIV, uh, which was my scenario. I, uh, uh, but it, it, it just, uh, it happens. So, yeah. So anyway, point being is go get checked out and uh, get your HIV test. And uh, if you do, like uh, when I was at the hospital, none of the doctors or nurses I had seen in AIDS patients with my, uh, they just barely ever see AIDS patients there and they'd never seen an AIDS patient within like, a, I was within a month or two of my diagnosis and in that C4 count range and they hadn't seen someone uh, with like my specific uh, like stage of diagnosis and my CD4 count that just not had experience treating anyone with that. And for the medical, if there are medical professionals watching this that work at a hospital, uh, people like I've, I've months ago, I was at 75 CD4. I was about five months into uh, uh, treatment and it, I'm, I'm feeling much better right now. And I would, do much better in a hospital setting than I did then. Uh, but for, if you do have a patient, um, that is in their first month of diagnosis, and especially if they are not reacting well to the medications and, uh, they have a very low CD4 count, high fevers, that sort of thing, even if they do not have a secondary infection, uh, I want to emphasize how fragile their physical state may be, even if their vitals are okay. And they like every minute of sleep and every calorie is really uh, important at that stage is uh, all I can describe. I remember uh, one of the problems I had is they had me sitting around and I had 107 fever, 106.9 fever the evening before I went and my doctor wanted me to call the ambulance and go right then, but I, I was not up for it. I've described it before. I had chills and shaking, and I took a hot bath, and I was using a heated blanket, and I did not feel like 
like I was physically able to go in an ambulance or a car ride to the hospital at that time. And, uh, so I went in the morning after getting some sleep because I'm telling you the people in those stages, it is important to go to the hospital if you have the severe high symptom, I mean, uh, fever, but they need their calories and they need their sleep and their other symptoms will get worse if they are sleep deprived or calorie deprived. And, uh, that is, uh, so it's like in my, my situation now, I'm feeling much healthier. I'm not as frail and fragile, but, uh, you gotta really, uh, you're not gonna, they don't see patients like that very often anymore, which is awesome. Uh, but if you do, uh, it, it's a, uh, something I hope, uh, medical professionals understand. And for the AIDS patients watching this, if you are having severe symptoms to your Bictarvi or any of your other medications, a, it does get better with time, and B, partially, it is due to uh, your low CD4 count. Uh, your low CD4 count, for example, we have a dog, uh, uh, a Labrador re retriever, real good doggy, and I, uh, when I first met my partner uh, years ago, uh, her dog did not give me any significant allergy symptoms, and uh, leading up to my diagnosis, those symptoms got worse, uh, which was hard to explain because I didn't have those symptoms prior. And then after my diagnosis, we brought the dog back to our house and that was a mistake. Uh, that was a huge mistake. Um, it was worth a try though, to see if I was going to have allergy symptoms. But, and then a few months later, I was perfectly fine to be around the dog. But let me explain though, is that, um, uh, with a low CD4 count, you have a heightened immune system response in other ways. The CD4 cells are your primary immune response in most scenarios. HIV throws your body's balance off. There's a shortage of the CD4 cells. So you will have a disproportional uh, reaction. So I was having a severe allergic reaction to the dog, uh, medications, everything else at that time. And that's because the body will, uh, produce an excess of allergy antibodies. And that's the same for other types of immune system reactions. Uh, the body will have a more severe, uh, response and, uh, it can cause more severe symptoms. And that's just because the body is not evolved and uh, to deal with HIV. It's it's uh, reacting as if you did. Uh, I don't know as the body's doing its best job of producing more allergy antibodies, but it's just the you just needed more CD4 cells or something. So the point is, you got to be extra cautious with allergens. But then also the point is, is that those severe medicine side effects and allergic side effects that you may be experiencing with your low CD4 count may improve as your CD4 count improves. Uh, and that's because the, the C4 cells will be able to do their job and function better. And that gets to my last topic, which I need to study more. And I'm not currently on any uh, immune system modulators, uh, but that describes what an immune system modulator is. And I was talking about HCQ, I think in a previous video on here. And HCQ is one of the medications used to treat coronavirus. And it has been studied, but is not approved by the FDA as an AIDS immune system modulator. Patients that took it for six months continued to see uh, CD4 increases for another two months after they stopped taking it. And that specific medication, uh, was or that specific study was for patients whose CD4 counts were decreasing or had plateaued or were non responders to the antiretroviral medications. And it was uh, that uh, HCQ it, uh, was effective for those, and it's an immune system modulator. And if you read the studies, uh, that specific study. Um, it says it suppresses, it uses the words suppressed and immune system together in a sentence. And if you're a patient, you're like, shit, my immune system is already severely depressed. I do not want something to suppress my immune system more. 
But what I'm describing, what I just described with the, my experience with allergies is the body's immune reactions uh, may be off balance and more severe in other ways that cause you more severe symptoms in other ways. And ironically, uh, colloquially speaking, as in just commonly saying what you think of your immune system, you think of your just general health and that sort of thing, too severe of immune system reactions will actually uh, could make your health worse and what a non-doctor would understand as your immune system would actually weaken your immune system more. So some of those immune system modulators, when they say that they suppress certain aspects of your immune system, that might sound like a completely negative thing uh, that you would not want to do. And uh, But why I'm explaining it is because the, the language that is used in those studies can be difficult to understand because it's counterintuitive. Uh, it means, uh, it, it might sound like it's saying the opposite of what it is, uh, the real intention of those medications. But uh, if you understand it, then you're, you get it. But I just talked to my doctor today. I had my phone uh, appointment. They're doing phone and Zoom appointments for that clinic. Uh, they're doing a lot of the days where the people don't have to go into the clinic. Uh, Circle Health, they're doing a great job of limiting patients' exposure to coronavirus to keep them safe. Uh, so I'm happy to hear that. But I did my uh, phone call and I asked about immune system modulators because I'm not currently on any modulators. And uh, adding any medications, if you don't need a medication, it's not helping you. It's not good to take extra medications. Uh, there are side effects to every medication. There's, it, it takes a toll on your kidneys and liver, whatever medications. And uh, it's, if you don't need an immune system modulator and you're doing well with the antiretrovirals and good sleep and eating and when you're able to exercise and all that sort of thing. And by the way, for newly diagnosed if you're not already familiar with all this, if you're experiencing muscle pain, that's muscle atrophy, and you have protein deficiency, and you do not want to exercise, you want to get calories, and you want to rest. Uh, but once you're healthier, you'll be able to exercise again. Uh, but you don't, uh, your, your body will start eating its own muscles if you uh, have an advanced uh, stage, uh, you know, advanced stage AIDS. Uh, and uh, that's not good So, because there's a shortage of calories. Your body's burning up too much energy to fight the HIV infection. And without the antiretrovirals, your body can't fight it forever. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So, yeah, probably don't want to exercise for the time being. But me, personally, uh, six months, seven months out of a diagnosis, I'm starting, I'm doing really well with the calories. I, the calories ensures ensures hydro, uh, hydrolyzed collagen protein too. Uh, and if you don't have money for the insurers or whatever, uh, whey protein powder, make protein shakes, and uh, just get as much calories as you can. Uh, honestly, I think it'd be very difficult to be a vegan and have AIDS. There are some good high calorie vegan foods, uh, but honestly, uh, you know, a lot of the foods that wouldn't be considered healthy uh, for a normal person, like a BLT or something, is high calorie, it has protein and carbohydrates, and you need more protein, you need more carbohydrates, you don't want to have as much simple carbohydrates like sugar, but honestly, even that is better than nothing, because you do not want your body to run out of energy if you're a low weight advanced AIDS infection and you are uh, your body will eat on its muscles and I find uh, I don't know so anyway that's my advice and uh, read those studies I checked out and that's just some of my experience I just chill by myself self quarantine for my birthday and I uh, just wanted to make this video. I think it could be helpful for some people out there. Unfortunately, people with my experience is very rare. Uh, honestly, a lot of the people with advanced AIDS, uh, like what I experienced, are in Africa. Uh, 
and unfortunately some of them uh, some of you if you're watching this uh, might not have as much access to uh, the medications but I do know in South Africa you can get your antiretrovirals for like seven dollars a month or something like that uh, but uh, there's as I was speaking about if you're able to try to get in contact with a nonprofit or a church or a community center or whatever in your area if you are out there in uh, uh, somewhere uh, and uh, don't have the other means to do so I hope you have family that can help support you and just keep those uh, calories high uh, if, uh, if anything else so uh, yeah, yeah. And for any nonprofits out there, geez, people at the, in the late stage of AIDS, and if they're non responder medications have a low CD4 count, it can uh, be difficult to take care of themselves. So, if there's anything as nonprofits can do to help people in those situations, there's a lot of resources in the United States. If you are in the United States watching this, uh, get in contact with a, a clinic. Uh, Circle Health in Cleveland is great. Uh, but there's sorts of nonprofits and clinics like that all over that are free uh, and get in contact with a uh, social worker, a designated Medicare or Medicaid worker uh, for you, and they can help you get started with benefits. If you get denied benefits, reapply, uh, appeal your claim, and uh, it's possible to get transport to doctor's appointments. It's possible to get free housing. It's possible to get food assistance. It's possible to get free medication, either through Medicaid or through ADAP, ADAD. Uh, yeah, it sounds almost like ADD. ADAD, the Ryan White program. And uh, yeah. So make sure you do all that stuff with some of those uh, nonprofits can help you fill out all the paperwork for you. So you don't have to fill out all that paperwork yourself. You don't got to mail it in. You can just rest, get your sleep, get your calories. And uh, and if they, uh, the social worker or the nonprofit can't do everything you need for your help, look for uh, a church or whatever religious center or uh, there's different types of community centers. Uh, there's community centers for uh, the LGB community, for women and sex workers. There's ones for all sorts of stuff, uh, elderly, and uh, um, it's very, very rare for people elderly to have an AIDS diagnosis that was not previously known. But I'm just saying, uh, and then for adolescents too, if you're in a uh, there's all sorts of uh, different programs out there for people, and uh, especially in the United States, we're very fortunate to have the programs that we do here. I do not take it for granted being in the United States because in a lot of other places, it's very unfortunate, but there's some places out, and uh, my medication will cost $3,500 a month, but right now I'm getting it for $0 a month through ADAP. And I'm getting free shipping too. I don't even have to go there to get it. Uh, but there's some places in European countries where they don't have government assistance and they would just have to pay that full multi-thousand dollar thing. And what those people do in a lot of cases if they can't afford it, besides just get sick, uh, is uh, they get it from Thailand uh, and there's some other places that are have very low priced medications and they got no questions asked doctor's office where foreigners can go and buy medication and uh, that might be what some people might have to do in those situations or go without medication which is not advisable um, but that's just the reality for some people I believe in India in Mexico you can get the medications for free I was reading somebody's story from India. They didn't have a choice of which medication they could get, though. Uh, as I was saying, a lot of people have different side effects from different medications. It took me a long time to acclimate to mine. Uh, but, yeah. That is, uh... That's what I wanted to explain in this video. And, uh... Outside of those other studies, I wanted to, uh... 
provide support advice if there's anyone out there. Fortunately, there's not many people out there. I hope uh, I hope somebody that could use this information watches this video, but honestly, uh, there aren't a whole lot of people out there uh, nowadays that have a, a late AIDS diagnosis, fortunately, but for the few out there that are still getting such a diagnosis, it might be difficult to uh, find information about it. If you search your viral counts, you'll find studies. If you're in an 800,000 million viral count, you'll find people talking about getting diagnosed with, H with HIV in the first two years when the, with the initial viral count spike before the viral count goes back down and then increases again. And then the, if you're looking for studies about uh, low CD4 and stuff, you know, you'll find studies about 100, 104, 100 CD4 range and 150, and you'll have a difficult time finding stuff about 10 CD4, 15 CD4, and whatever. So uh, it can be difficult to find the right information. And the most frustrating part, and you probably already experienced this, if you're a uh, if you're a recently diagnosed AIDS patient, is you'll die. You'll not. Oh my goodness, that was I, I was so mis I misspoke there. I said diagnosis. You're not going to die. It'll be all right. I just said that, was, that, that sounded horrible. But uh, seriously, though, uh, when you're googling stuff, you will find uh, uh, you'll search stuff about AIDS, and then the, all the stuff will be like, oh. Uh, the best, the best treatment, or the best, uh, it's is best for early detection. And uh, people don't get. It. And the articles will say uh, the best way, like uh, uh, that we can prevent AIDS is through early detection. And you're like, as an AIDS patient trying to Google information about uh, low C4 count late diagnosis, when your all your Google results are always showing you pages about AIDS and HIV that just talk about early early uh, detection, early, di 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 early detection. If you get early detection when your CD4 counts are still high, it'll never develop into AIDS. Early detection, early detection. And your Google results will be full of that, I assure you, when you're doing Google searches for all this sort of thing, anything related to AIDS, it'll just tell you about how early detection can prevent AIDS. And you're like, Oh, no shit, thanks a lot. And somebody commented on one of my responses a long time ago, like, oh, you just need condoms. I was like, oh, well, you know, that does not help you uh, once you are uh, have a advanced HIV infection for a decade and you have AIDS, like, thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, you're not helping anybody. And a lot of people out there that are judgmental of people, first off, there's so many damn heavy, uh, uh, heavy needles which, with the opioid epidemic out there. Any of y'all talking shit can uh, step on a needle any day. So don't even start to judge somebody. But I don't know somebody's life. I don't know. There's all sorts of things. You could be uh, giving somebody a hard time that uh, was abused or had some other sort of experience as a youngster uh by a stranger or something like that and you could be uh you could be shaming somebody that you really should not be talking trash about and it's uh it breaks my heart to read some of the stories about some of the people and especially other countries the united states is very tolerant and progressive on this topic and accepting and supporting of AIDS patients, but there's people in other countries that have stigmas and are judged, and it's uh, difficult enough to be sick and given a terminal diagnosis uh, and the unpleasant physical symptoms and having to experience all those symptoms and then just to uh, have people treat you poorly after that, uh, I can't imagine. Uh, so there's even been play, uh, you know, people, family members dis disowning them and stuff like that. And I cannot fathom uh, having to go through such an experience. Uh, and speaking of that, 
there's a, there's some countries that are still way behind on uh, certain human rights things. For example, in Saudi Arabia, prisoners that are HIV positive are put in a separate section and they are not given medication. And I and those prisons are already uh, very unpleasant as it is. But I can tell you uh, that's beyond cruel and unusual punishment having uh, advanced HIV infection myself and talking about the uh, impacts it has on the brain and that sort of thing is, uh, uh, it's uh, unfathomable that they do that to people and uh, they need to change that. So if there's human rights organizations out there, that's probably uh, one issue they really should speak up about. Because I can't imagine uh, having to be denied the medication. And uh, especially towards my diagnosis with a very late and uh, uh, with a very advanced infection and late diagnosis. Uh, if I, uh, at that point, continually without treatment, I would not wish that on my worst enemy. But anyway, have a good day. I hope you learned something in this video. And uh, if you're watching this, if you are an advanced AIDS patient, you probably not, I hope you've watched this in parts or something and taken a nap or something because it's probably too much information and too much. I'm telling you, when I was first diagnosed, I would it was exhausting to speak a full sentence. Like it's impossible to explain that uh, level of fragility and fatigue. So, if you are in that situation, thank you for bearing with me and listening, and you'll be all right, and uh, continue on, uh, take a multivitamin, uh, I like, uh, I take omega-3s, fish oil, vitamin D, vitamin D, uh, all good stuff, vitamin D, uh, vitamin E and vitamin D are more absorbable through the caplets because it is fat soluble. Uh, if it's in your multivitamin, great. Just make sure you eat it with a fatty food or oily food so you absorb it better. Otherwise, get the caplets uh, that are have it suspended in oil, the gel caps. Um, and stay up on your nutrition uh, and study uh, all the supplements. If you're going to take herbal supplements, there's some good stuff out there. You might not be able to stomach a lot of it uh, with your medications, and a lot of it does have interactions with medications. So before you take any supplements, be sure to research if it interacts with your medications. And with that note, I'm out. This video has been about an hour, and uh, I'm going to do whatever I want today because it's my birthday. Peace out.